Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 68 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. On February 12, 1809, Nancy Hanks Lincoln gave birth to her second child a son that she and her husband Thomas Lincoln named Abraham. Abraham Lincoln grew up the son of a poor farmer, and yet, as you know, he managed to get elected as the 16th president of the United States. How did Lincoln achieve this great feat? Today, just a few days before his 207th birthday, we explore Lincoln's journey to the presidency. Our guide for this investigation is Richard Brookheiser, author of Founder's Son, A Life of Abraham Lincoln. During our exploration, Richard reveals how and why Abraham Lincoln entered politics, Lincoln's political ideology and the role founding fathers played in shaping Lincoln's political ideas, and details about how Lincoln became the 16th president of the United States. But first, if you enjoy this podcast, please consider supporting the Ben Franklin's World crowdfunding campaign. This campaign asks for financial and non-financial contributions that will help the show keep sounding great, and that will help us bring early American history to more of our fellow history lovers, and perhaps even to people who don't yet know that they love history. That would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? For more information about this campaign and the ways that you can help out, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash movement or text support BF world to 33444. Hmm. I feel like we should sing happy birthday to Abraham Lincoln before we begin this episode. But then again, why sing when we can explore history? With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Today's guest is a writer and columnist for the National Review. His interest in modern day politicians led to an interest in the founding period. He has written 11 books, seven about founding fathers. He is a native of Irondequoit, New York, a resident of New York City, and he joins us today to discuss his newest book, Founder's Son, A Life of Abraham Lincoln. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Richard Brookheiser. Thanks for having me. Richard, you have written books about George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Governor Morris, James Madison, and John Adams. These are all founding fathers. So how did you come to write a book about Abraham Lincoln? Well, you know, you you do think about Lincoln if you're interested in American history. Uh, and so the thought had crossed my mind, and I'd always put it aside because there are just so many books about Lincoln, and how could you possibly get into such a crowded field? Uh, and then I was having a coffee with an old friend of mine who's a professor at Yale Law School named Akil Lamar, and this was after my Madison book had just come out, and Akil said, uh, I know what your next book should be. Uh, it should be a book about Lincoln and the Founding Fathers and call it Founder's Son. And so I thought for like half a second, and I realized this was a brilliant idea. Uh, this was just my way into Lincoln. I knew enough about Lincoln to see that the Founding Fathers had always been very important to him, and so I was off and running with that suggestion. I wonder about your process. Founder's son investigates the evolution of Lincoln's ideas and how he understood and evoked the founders. Richard, how does one research how Abraham Lincoln, or any other person from the past, thought? Well, with Lincoln, you begin with his collected works. They're all online. Every letter he ever wrote, every speech he ever gave. It's not that bulky. He, of course, was murdered and cut short, and uh, he never kept diaries or journals. His surviving letters are most of them all businesslike. So it's uh, it's a pretty compact uh, collection of material. And then I began by asking friends of mine who have written about Lincoln, studied Lincoln, for their advice. How, how do I get into Lincoln world? 
and they gave me some useful suggestions. They they told me which were the better biographies, uh, which ones I should start with. I had already read probably the most important book about Lincoln in the last 70 or 80 years, which was Crisis of the House Divided by Harry Jaffa. That came out in 1959. It just missed the centennial of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And Jaffa really uh, rescued Lincoln from mid-century historians who were doing a lot of good work on the details of his life, but kind of uh, losing the forest for the trees. And Jaffa said, look, this was a man involved in the great crisis of American history, and he was not only in it, he understood it, he got it. And that was crucially in part because of his understanding of the American founding. So uh, Harry really uh, brought the attention of historians back to uh, Lincoln's ideas, and, and Harry did have a sense that the founders were important to him. When and how did Lincoln first encounter the legacy of the founding fathers? I don't imagine he actually met a founding father in person. No, I mean, his, his early life overlapped with the late life of some of the younger founding fathers, but, you know, they never came out to Indiana or, or, or Illinois, and then Lincoln never got to the East Coast uh, until after they were dead. So uh, all his encounters with these men had to be in, in books. And uh, the first one he encounters is George Washington, and this is when he's a boy. And he reads The Life of General George Washington by uh, Mason Locke Weems, or Parson Weems. And this was one of the first biographies that was uh, written about uh, Washington. It came out a a year after Washington died. And it was aimed at young adults, what we'd now call young adults. But it, it also helped shape Americans' view of Washington's life and career. We think about Weems now about his storytelling and and often his exaggerations, but Weems did a pretty good job of of getting the life in in shape and understandable shape. And what inspired Lincoln about Weems' account was not so much the stories like the story of the cherry tree, but they were Weems' accounts of Washington's uh, heroism and struggling for liberty. And Lincoln actually cited Weems in 1861 when he's on his way to his first inauguration and the country is falling apart. And he recalls the Battle of Trenton when he's passing through Trenton, New Jersey. He takes a train from his home in Illinois to Washington, D.C., and Trenton is one of the stops. And he remembers what Weems wrote about that battle, and he remembers that Weems presented it as a struggle for liberty in the world. The fate of liberty in the world was being decided at Trenton in 1776. And clearly Lincoln thinks he's in a similar situation. Uh, as he ages, he, he encounters, or he focuses on different founding fathers. I think he was very influenced by Thomas Paine in his 20s, Paine is the great journalist of the founding. Lincoln is also interested in Paine's religious writing, which was very combative. Paine was not an atheist. He was a deist, but he he really attacked organized religion, uh, particularly Christianity. And when Lincoln was 20-something, he he thought this was very exciting and liberating. Uh, He would change his views on religion over time. But I think what he permanently took from Paine was just a a model of how to use humor to make serious points. This is something Paine is very good at, especially in a vein of mockery. And and Lincoln would be a master of this himself. And then the, the third important founder for Lincoln, of course, is Jefferson. And he calls on Jefferson really beginning in 1854, after the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, uh, which opens the remainder of the Louisiana Territory to slavery, which had been forbidden by the Missouri Compromise of 1820. But uh, now Congress, led by Stephen Douglas, decides, well, well, we'll organize this territory and we'll let the people who live there decide whether they want it to be slave or free. And this enrages the North. It galvanizes Lincoln. And among the many arguments he uses is that 
our principles were incarnated in the Declaration of Independence. And, and there, Jefferson says that all men are created equal and that that should be uh, the guide for our policy for slavery in new territories. Uh, Lincoln is not saying that he will touch it in the South where it, where it already exists, and he maintains that right through his election and even in the first year of the Civil War. But he says it must be contained. It must not expand because this is an evil thing that we have to accept where it is, but we cannot allow it to grow. And Jefferson is his touchstone in making that argument. I'd like to talk about the development of Lincoln's political career. But while we're on the subject, you mentioned George Washington, Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine. Did you get a sense that one of those founders influenced Lincoln's political ideology or his personal outlook more than another? Well, political ideology, it would be Jefferson, because Jefferson directly addresses the issue of human equality. And Jefferson's also influential in the Northwest Ordinance. As a young congressman, Jefferson proposed that slavery be banned west of the Appalachians. Congress didn't do that, but they did ban it in the old Northwest, which would become the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And of course, that's where the Lincoln family moves. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is, is born in Kentucky, but his father moves the family to Indiana when uh, young Abe is seven years old. And, and part of the reason for that is uh, his father, who was a you know, a white man of very modest means, uh, didn't want to compete with slave labor. I mean, he was a farmer, he was a carpenter, and, uh, you know, just felt it was unfair to be a working white person and having to compete with farmers and plantation owners who owned slaves. So he moves to a brand new state, Indiana, in the Northwest Territory, where slavery had been forbidden. So this was very important in the lives of the Lincoln family, and it was influenced by Jefferson's youthful desire uh, to see slavery confined and contained. How did Lincoln go from being the son of a poor farmer to being a politician? Why did he decide to enter politics and how did he enter the arena? Well, he, you know, in his early 20s, he, he bumbles around with a lot of different careers. He's a river boatman. He's a blacksmith. He's a postmaster. He's a surveyor, but the uh, he even keeps a store for a while, and it fails, and this uh, plunges him into debt, which takes him years to work off. But he, the two careers that he settles on are law and politics. And, of course, in early 19th century America, they're related. A lot of politicians are lawyers and, and vice versa. And he picks those because uh, he's got natural talents for them. He's smart. Uh, he can talk. Uh, he can talk well on his feet. And he's ambitious. Uh, he wants to make a name for himself. Uh, so he teaches himself the law. And uh, he gets into politics in his early 20s. He, he first runs for the Illinois legislature when he's 23. And he loses that election. But he runs again the next time when he's 25. And he wins. You know, politics was something that uh, was fluid on the frontier, on a new state. There wasn't a political establishment. It was easier for a newcomer to break in. And so he did. Lincoln's early career sounds a lot like our early career phases today. We're always trying out something new to see what fits. <laughs> well, yes. And, you know, it was a, it was a frontier setup, so uh, everybody there was doing it. When many of us think of Lincoln, we also think of Stephen Douglas. And in 1858, Lincoln debated Stephen Douglas seven times. We know those debates as the famed Lincoln-Douglas debates, when both men were vying for one of Illinois Senate seats. I wonder if you would tell us about those debates. You know, what were these debates about and why are they so famous? Well, the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates, as you say, are the seven that they had in 1858 when they're running against each other for the Senate. But it's also the part of a longer Lincoln-Douglas debate, which really begins in 1854 when Douglas gets Congress to pass the Kansas-Nebraska Act 
allowing slavery into this unorganized territory. And Douglas is uh, the premier political figure in Illinois, Lincoln's state. Lincoln and Douglas have known each other for years. They've been in opposite political parties. Douglas is a lifelong Democrat. Lincoln starts off as a Whig, and then he eventually becomes a Republican after the Whig party dies and disappears. So they've been going at it for years, but then the issue of slavery in the territories sharpens their rivalry. And Lincoln really becomes Douglas's gadfly from 1854 on. He tries to join him in the Senate uh, in 1855. He runs against him for the Senate in 1858. And then finally, he runs against him for president in 1860. And that's when he beats Douglas. Now, the, the 1858 election, you, you have to realize that, that for senatorial candidates to debate was unprecedented. And the reason for that is that until the 20th century, senators were picked by state legislatures. They were not picked by a direct vote of the people. So the choice was made by legislative politics at the state level, and often it was very much an insider's game. But what happened in Illinois in 1858 is that each man had secured the loyalty of his party. The Democrats had announced that Stephen Douglas is our man. You know, he's the incumbent. We want him reelected. We will not support anyone else. Similarly, the new Republican Party said, Lincoln is our candidate. We're not going to vote for anyone else. Uh, any Republican in the legislature will vote for Lincoln and nobody else. So, in other words, uh, ahead of the election, it was clear that the two parties were only going to support these men. And then what happened was Douglas gave two speeches, uh, one in Springfield, the capital, another one in Chicago, and Lincoln spoke quickly after him. Uh, on one occasion, he answered Douglas on, later in the same day. The other time, he, he spoke the next day. And then the two candidates decided, all right, let's formalize this. Illinois then had nine congressional districts. Uh, we've already appeared almost together in two of them, uh, where Springfield is, where Chicago is. Let's have seven more appearances in the other congressional districts in the state. So that's why we have the seven debates. They span the state of Illinois. Uh, uh, Freeport is up by the Wisconsin border. Uh, Jonesboro is, is down in the southern tip of Illinois between Missouri and Kentucky. Uh, and these guys were not only uh, traveling around by train to their joint debates, they were also making speeches and appearances in between. So it was a grueling, grueling schedule. And the whole state was riveted some of these towns, the crowd that came to the debate was larger than the entire population of the town. These were long debates. The format was that one of them would open for an hour, then uh, the opponent would get 90 minutes to reply, and then the first speaker would get a half an hour to rebut. And then they alternated who would begin each debate. So Douglas got to begin and end four times. Lincoln got to begin and end three times. So it's a you know it's a three hour format, uh, and there was a lot of you know there were crowd reactions and there was some heckling and there was some jeering. But it, it seems as if the crowds were pretty attentive to what was going on, and a lot of it was was very nitpicky politics you know well you said this your side said that no of course i didn't you know and and it's frankly rather boring to read now but what's surprising is how much of it really got to very vital issues they grappled with each other on the nature of slavery and the nature of popular sovereignty and they also grappled with each other on the Founding Fathers and their view of what America should be like. Douglas said the Founding Fathers made a country of popular choice. People could choose how to govern themselves. That was their vision. That is my vision. I want Americans who move into territories to be able to decide for themselves whether this territory is going to admit slavery or not. 
And then Lincoln said, well, of course I'm for popular sovereignty. Of course I'm for popular choice. But if a man rules himself, that's popular sovereignty. But if he rules himself and another man, in other words, a slave, that's not popular sovereignty. That's despotism. And this was a point he made repeatedly. Now, it's a tricky point because he also has to say, I am not going to threaten slavery where it already exists. It's an institution we have. There it is. We have to accept it where it is. But we must not let it grow because it is against American principles. America's principles are that all men are created equal. We have to accept the fact that slavery exists among us and has existed for centuries before we were even independent. But we cannot be true to ourselves and let it increase in size. And so we have to forbid slavery in the territories. So this was their back and forth. It's amazing to me that so much is similar between the debates of today and the debates of the 1850s, and also how much is different. Like, I don't know many people who would sit through a four-hour debate today. Also, the candidates in the 1850s had so much longer to speak about issues than modern politicians have in our modern debates. And there's also the fact that candidates in the 1850s didn't have loudspeakers. I wonder how many in the crowd really heard what Lincoln and Douglas were saying. Well, you know, they must have projected their voices differently. And this is what everybody did. So everybody was used to speaking in a different fashion. And when you were speaking outdoors, there would be backdrops on the stage, you know, which would help push the voice out. Now, you know, having said all that, I'm I'm sure, you know, people at the very back, uh, they probably were missing stuff. And it's also true, Douglas lost his voice over the course of the campaign. By the last debate, he was was described as barking, almost. And Lincoln's own voice was described as kind of high, a little nasal, almost a slight whine to it. But that helps you project in the open air. One of the Republican debates in this cycle lasted over three hours. But, of, of course, the difference is there were a lot more candidates on the stage and they were only given, what, like 90 seconds or two minutes to speak. So that's sound bites. That's little bits of time. And these guys were going for an hour, for 90 minutes, for half an hour. But also people were used to that then. I mean, people were used to sermons. People were used to long summations to juries. Uh, This was also the entertainment that people had. You know, what's media? Media was newspapers. There was no radio, television, obviously. And there was traveling theater. If you lived in a city, there might be opera, but people out in the the sticks of Illinois are not hearing opera. So, So public speaking was, it was something that people did, and it was something that people listened to. It was just in everybody's culture. As you read through these debates... Did you get a sense of whether the founders influenced Stephen Douglas's politics as well, or did they just influence Lincoln's positions? No, Douglas also has his view of the founders, and he called the role of them in one of the debates. He said, you know, Washington and Jefferson and Jay and Hamilton and the great men of that day, uh, they left a country that was uh, half slave and half free, and see how successful we have been. You know, and why can't we continue it? Why can't we keep following their model? Also, they pioneered a popular government. They pioneered popular sovereignty. And that's my position. That's my belief. He called it the great principle of popular sovereignty. And he, he must have said great principle because Lincoln mocks him. And in one of the debates, it's printed out as with like a couple R's, you know, great principle. That was Douglas's view of the founding. And he, he also said that when the Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal, it's only uh, talking about white men, white men of European descent. And, and he says in one of, the, uh, uh, one of the debates, he says it's not talking about Negroes or, or Indians or Malays or Fijis. This is about white men of European descent. And then Lincoln has to rebut by saying, well, no, it means all men. 
Uh, and Lincoln has to be careful because most people are racists in those days. Most white men, including people who oppose slavery, uh, you know, they're more racist than anyone today would, would admit to being. One of the charges that Douglas would make repeatedly was that, well, Republicans are interested in amalgamation, meaning interracial marriage and interracial sex. And Lincoln's answer to this, and he, he does it many times in different forms, is he says, just because I don't want a black woman for a slave doesn't mean I have to have her for a wife. I can just let her alone. Now, now that's a joke. That's a laugh line. But he's also making a serious point, because if you let her alone, you're letting her be free. So he has to be aware of the prejudices of his audience, and his own prejudices, frankly. But he's also making the point that, you know, just because we may not like black people or we don't want to marry them, uh, we also must not hold them or anyone as slaves. It seems that like many mid-19th century Americans, Abraham Lincoln held strong views about slavery. Today, when we think about Lincoln and slavery, we think of his Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment, which is the one that ended slavery. Richard, would you tell us about the evolution of Lincoln's position on slavery? Was he always a staunch anti-slavery man? As early as 1837, when he's in the Illinois legislature, he proposes a, a motion, which is only supported by one other man. So there are like two of them out of, out of 100 guys. And uh, they say that although they're opposed to abolitionists who wanted you know, all slavery ended, they said that slavery is bad morals and bad policy, and that the federal government ought to encourage the end of it in the District of Columbia. Now, that was the one place where the federal government could do anything it wanted about slavery or anything else, because it was directly ruled by the federal government. Uh, the federal government could not have, without passing a constitutional amendment, it could not have affected slavery in a state. But the federal government could affect it in the district. So as early as 1837, Lincoln is saying that the federal government should propose a plan to compensate the owners of slaves in the district to pay them for their slaves and to liberate them after a certain date, you know, give people some time to adjust to this plan. And then he said, but they shouldn't do this unless the people of the district, the white people of the district, uh, agree to it, you know, vote to accept this proposal. And then he makes a similar proposal when he's in Congress. He serves from 1847 to 1849, and he offers a similar idea there. So this is, this is early in his career. He thinks that slavery is a bad thing, and where it's possible, the one place where it's possible for the federal government to do something about it, it should. And then the Kansas-Nebraska Act uh, galvanizes him on the issue of slavery in the territories. Uh, when he's elected president in 1860, he says repeatedly uh, that he is not going to touch slaves in the South. He, he writes an old friend of his who's from Georgia. He says, your slaves will be as safe as they were in the days of Washington. But the difference between us is that we Republicans think slavery is, is a bad thing that should not be extended. You think it's a good thing that should be. And then he ends by saying, I suppose that is the rub. Well, yes, it was the rub, and it was going to lead to the Civil War in a few months. Early in the Civil War, he stopped some Union commanders from issuing liberation orders in places where there are slaves, uh, such as Missouri. Now, Missouri was a slave state that stayed in the Union. Four slave states did, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. And Lincoln is very careful to not liberate slaves early in the war because he's particularly anxious to keep Kentucky in the Union. The Union strategy to beat the South is to encircle it and squeeze it to death, essentially. It was called the Anaconda Plan. And this involved going down the Mississippi River from the north, capturing New Orleans, moving up from the south, blockading the entire coast of the south, 
and then trying to push in through Tennessee and through Virginia. This is what the Union ends up doing. It uh, takes four years. It's extremely bloody. But if it had had to start, if Kentucky had left the Union, the Anaconda would have had to start on the Ohio River. It would have been a much harder thing. And Lincoln says to lose Kentucky is, is virtually to lose the whole game. So he's anxious to keep Kentucky in the Union. It is a slave state. It's a loyal slave state. So he doesn't want to do anything to disgust Kentuckians. And this, uh, this annoys the people in his own party, the so-called radical Republicans. Uh, one of them, a senator from Ohio, he says, well, Lincoln, uh, Lincoln is just white trash. I mean, this is the reason he's being so cautious. He's white trash. But by, by the middle of 1862, Lincoln is realizing that the North, it needs black soldiers. And it also needs to weaken the military resistance of the South. You know, slaves are an important resource. They do work that their masters are then free to go off and fight. So that's his reason for uh, deciding to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. And he makes a preliminary announcement after the Battle of Antietam. And then he issues the proclamation on January 1st, 1863. But uh, this, this is to free the slaves of rebels. And it's limited to that because he's doing this as an executive order. This is an executive action. And he can only do it as commander-in-chief in time of rebellion. So in other words, slaves in loyal slave states are not affected. Slaves in parts of the South that the Union has reconquered are not affected. So Tennessee, West Virginia, New Orleans, which we took early on, uh, parts of coastal Virginia, slaves there are not affected by the Emancipation Proclamation. But where there are rebels, which is most of the South, those slaves are then, thenceforward, and forever free. And then the final liberation is at the end of the war. Uh, This is the 13th Amendment, which will end slavery throughout the United States. It passes Congress at the beginning of 1865, and it goes out to the states, uh, and it will be ratified in, in December after Lincoln has been murdered. It's actually pretty remarkable that Lincoln becomes president, because as you mentioned earlier, Lincoln loses a lot of elections. But he wins the presidency. Mm -hmm. How does Lincoln become the Republican Party's presidential nominee as a perennial loser? I mean, the Republican Party is trying to get their first party member elected president. Well, the the Lincoln-Douglas debates were a national spectacle. They, They were covered by newspapers across the country. And even though he loses that election, that senatorial election, he makes a national name for himself. He's asked to give speeches in the East. His East Coast debut is the Cooper Union Address in New York City in February of 1860. And, and clearly, he's already thinking about the Republican nomination. Uh, he's, he's helped partly by the fact that he's a fresh face. The front runner is William Seward, a senator from New York, former governor. Seward's a very smart man, very forthright on the issue of slavery, but uh, he has baggage. He's been in politics longer than Lincoln has, and as governor and senator, he's taken some positions that uh, you know, make him unpopular with people on a variety of issues. And this is true of some of the other Republicans who also want that nomination in 1860 and who are older and more experienced than Lincoln is. One of the downsides of experience is you know, you've made enemies for yourself. So Lincoln is kind of ideally positioned. He's prominent enough that he's in the running, but he's not so prominent that other people are worried about him or sniping at him. And he manages, through friends of his on the National Committee, to get the convention put in Illinois. They were also thinking of St. Louis, but it's in Chicago. It's in his home state. So he's got a local advantage. And then the final little trick, uh, one of his guys ran the convention's uh, seating arrangements, and he put the two biggest delegations, New York and Pennsylvania, far apart, so they couldn't communicate easily. And these were two states that were run by opponents of Lincoln for the nomination, so they would be hampered in their plotting and their planning. 
They also uh, issued uh, fraudulent tickets to the convention, so they packed the galleries with Lincoln supporters. <laughs> so, you know, politics, uh, there's hardball in politics, and this was true even in 1860. So Lincoln wins the nomination, and then the election is a four-man race. The Democratic Party has split in two. Stephen Douglas is the candidate of the northern half of it. The southerners, who people who are even more pro-slavery than he is, run their own candidate. And then there's a fourth party, which is called the Constitutional Union Party, and they're basically old conservative Whigs who do want the country to stay together, but they just wish everybody would shut up about slavery. That's their position. Let's not talk about this. Let's just preserve the union. So you you have a four-man race. Nobody wins a majority of the popular vote. Lincoln is first, but he only has almost 40%. Douglas is second with just under 30 percent, and then the Southerner and the Constitutional Unionists trail. But if you look at the Electoral College, if Lincoln's three opponents had only been one man, if the three of them had picked one of them, and if every supporter of the three had only voted for one opponent of Lincoln, Lincoln still would have won in the Electoral College. He would have lost uh, two states that he carried, and uh, some other electoral votes from New Jersey, but he still would have had a majority in the Electoral College. And that is because by 1860, the North and the Midwest, which was settled from the North, were just uh, united in their opposition to the expansion of slavery. And this is something that Lincoln had been talking about eloquently uh, for six years. So that's how he gets to the White House. Once he's in the White House, Lincoln practices politics and leads the United States in a way that many of our own present day politicians find inspirational, including President Obama. Romy wonders if you could shed light on Lincoln's leadership style. How did Lincoln practice politics and lead the nation? Well, what Obama was impressed with was Doris Kearns Goodwin's very excellent book uh, called Team of Rivals, which really focused on Lincoln's cabinet. And she made the point that he put in his cabinet all the men who'd run against him for the Republican presidential nomination. Uh, Seward became his secretary of state. Uh, He made another one of these opponents his treasury secretary. And the third one was his attorney general. So he's bringing people that he's beaten into his administration. So he has all factions in the Republican Party represented. He's very good at keeping them all together. And part of that is a matter of personality. He is a leader. He's a strong leader. He's firm, but he's not sharp-elbowed. He's not in your face. He knows how to jolly people along. One of his techniques is telling stories. He knows a million of them, a million funny stories. He's got a repertoire. And this, you know, it breaks tension. It makes people think well of him. It smooths down the sharp edges. That's what he uses in face-to-face relations. He also is very mindful of public opinion. There's no polling then, but he sets aside a certain amount of time every day to see visitors to the White House. And these are people from all over the, you know, the loyal part of the country who are coming to him for this, that, and the other thing. I mean, you know, it's like personal favors, it's it's political points, it's religious people who say, you know, God wants you to free the slaves, you know, some of them are crackpots. I mean, it's it's just the whole gamut of stuff. And he calls these meetings his public opinion baths. So by day after day after day uh, of seeing and talking to all these people, he's, he gets a sense of where Americans are. And then also these people go home and tell everyone, well, I was in the White House. I saw the president. And most of them leave with a good impression. So so that is also getting out to the country. Now, Lincoln does not travel as president much. He takes uh, one trip to Maryland, and of course the Gettysburg Address is in Pennsylvania, but mostly he sticks in Washington. So he's not going around the country himself, but people are coming to him and they're going back home. So it's a combination of all these factors allow him to hold the Republican Party together 
and that is the majority party in Congress for the whole duration of his presidency. Before we move into the time warp, would you tell us why you think it is important for us in the 21st century to understand how and why Abraham Lincoln understood the founding fathers as he did in the mid-19th century? Well, because we make our most important advances and we secure our prosperity and our liberty when we understand where it has come from. We're not that old a country, you know, as countries go. So the founding, all right, it's over 200 years, but, you know, that's that's not as far back as Charlemagne or Alfred the Great. And it was a founding with principles. I mean, it was based on a revolution, a revolution that had principles that had ideas about humanity and what it was and what rights it had. And that's what guides this country. That's what guides this country at its best. And I think our most thoughtful presidents, our most thoughtful politicians have been aware of that and have been able to call on that in moments of crisis. It's time for the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Earlier in our discussion, we mentioned that Lincoln's perennial political rival was Stephen Douglas. Douglas died on June 3rd, 1861. But David wonders what would have happened if Stephen Douglas had lived. Would he have challenged Lincoln in the election of 1864? And if he had, how would history be different? Well, I, I think Douglas certainly would have have kept his hand in as a presidential candidate. He and Lincoln were about the same age, so Douglas was certainly fit to run again. He would have been a, a war Democrat. He would have been a Democrat who wanted to preserve the Union. Douglas was an old follower of Andrew Jackson. Preserving the Union was very important to, to Jackson and to Douglas. So there was, throughout the war, a large peace faction in the Democratic Party, but essentially pro-Southern traitors, frankly. Uh, Douglas would have had no truck with them. But I'm sure he would have attacked Lincoln for his management of the war. The North lost a lot of battles. Uh, it had a lot of bad generals before Lincoln found Grant. Douglas would have made hay with that. And I imagine that would have been his program as 1864 approached. And he might have said, look, uh, we should have won this war a lot earlier. Uh, Let's get it done. Uh, Mr. Lincoln has, has just proven himself to be an incompetent executive, and I can do better. Are you continuing with Abraham Lincoln for your next project, or are you returning to the founding period? Well, almost to the founding period. My next project is John Marshall, the man who made the Supreme Court. So he is a very young founding father. He stays active longer than than any other men in that generation. He's chief justice of the Supreme Court until 1835. So he is holding office until the presidency of Andrew Jackson. He's chief justice for 34 years, the longest tenure of anyone who, who's held that job. I'll tell you one quick story about him. When uh, Marshall becomes chief justice, the Supreme Court already has a tradition that uh, when they deliberate, they can only have wine if it's raining outside, if it's a gloomy day. So Marshall would ask uh, Justice Story, one of his associate justices, he would always ask him to look out the window and say, well, what's the weather? And, you know, Marshall could see the window as well as anyone, but Story would come back and say the sun is shining. And then Marshall would say, well, our jurisdiction is so vast that it must be raining somewhere. So wine was always served at the Marshall Court. That is a funny story. If we're interested in your other books, or if we still have more questions about Abraham Lincoln and how the Founding Fathers influenced him, Where is the best place to look for more information about you and how we can get in contact with you? 
Well, I have a website. It's um, richardbrookheiser.com, all, all one word. And uh, you can uh, people can ask questions there, and I, they get uh, they get sent to my email. So I do respond. And be patient. Sometimes I'm distracted, but but I will get to you. Richard, thank you for taking the time today to help us explore Abraham Lincoln and his political ideology. Well, thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Our exploration of Abraham Lincoln's politics and rise to the presidency helps us consider just how important ideas and their evolution are to the past and to the present. For example, let's look at Lincoln's reading habits. Since he was a boy, Lincoln enjoyed reading, and like many of us, one of his favorite topics to read about was the American Revolution and its leaders. Lincoln read about this period because he wanted to learn more about how his country was founded. As he read, Lincoln paid attention to the founders' ideas, what they thought about slavery, liberty, freedom, and religion. He also took the time to consider how the founders' ideas worked in the mid-19th century and about how he could modify some of the founders' ideas so that they would work in the 19th century. Ideas about the past shape Lincoln's thoughts about how he could make his present a better place in which to live, just as ideas from the past shape our thoughts about how we might affect a better future in our 21st century. It seems timely that we should recognize the role ideas play in our past and present. After all, presidential primary season is upon us. You can find more information about Richard, his book, Founder's Son, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 068. President's Day is nearly upon us. I know this isn't a holiday where one normally gives a present, but I want to give you one, a complimentary copy of the Ben Franklin's World app. The app automatically gets all the episodes of the show, and it allows you to have all of the show's most important information and links right at your fingertips. To receive your gift, all you need to do is visit benfranklinsworld.com slash apps or search for Ben Franklin in your favorite app store. You could also celebrate President's Day by telling your friends, family, and social media followers about this episode or perhaps about one of your favorite episodes about George Washington. Word of mouth recommendations are the best way to help people discover podcasts. And I am always really grateful when you take the time to tell people about the show because your efforts have really helped this podcast grow. What do you think about the differences between the Lincoln-Douglas debates Richard described and our present-day presidential debates? Do you think candidates need more time to discuss issues? Do you think we should alter the debate system that we have in place? Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.